is Rory O'Toole. And my name is Matt Schultz. And this is How to Be. The podcast where we discuss ancient wisdom, modern hacks, paperback self-help books, and pithy platitudes. In the hopes of figuring out the best way to live this one precious and wild life. Do you have dreams of making it big? Do you think life is all about the hustle? If so, join us as we discuss ambition. rare today is april 1st which is april fool's day oh yeah which brings me to uh, we can't have anything without corporations coming in and ruining it did they are they like doing something for april fool's day a a lot of corporations do like netflix will have a fake movie google is famous for doing little april fool's jokes oh what's the netflix fake movie uh should i check i don't know if they do it anymore they must Mm. It's like their thing. Oh, I didn't even know that. I saw Sex in the City is on Netflix now. At oh, least. wait, yeah, that's the first thing that came up for me. Maybe they're not doing it this year. Sex in the City came up for you? Yeah. <laughs> Isn't that exciting? I watched the first episode today. Oh, wait, the TV show is on? Yeah. I it's just the movie. No. Sex mm-hmm. in the City. Oh, oh my goodness. God. Uh What an exciting time to be a single woman in New York. The early aughts or right now? The early aughts, man. I know. I guess it was, didn't the show start in the 90s? Or was it 2008, I think? Yeah. Yeah. The naughties, as they call them? No, the naughties is just the zero zeros. Oh, why is it called the naughties? Like the twenties, the not is. Oh, I thought the noughties were the late nineties. Nineties through the aughts. Yeah. No, there was like sort of a battle for a little bit between whether it would be the knots or the aughts. I see. And most people have gone with aughts, but the not tease is a relic of knots. Oh, I hear that a lot in when it comes to fashion bloggers talking about style. Mm. Mean a lay? Not mean a lay. No, not mean a lay. <laughs> not uh, mean a lay. I miss when it was radical to be a woman in your 30s living in a city. Yeah, it was radical. It was exciting. It really, it really felt like a, a the dawn of a new era, yeah. like the way, the way that they talk about casual hookups, mm-hmm. and it was this new exciting thing. <laughs> oh, I have sex with a man, and afterwards I feel nothing, but don't you feel sad when he doesn't call you, honey? I'm not calling him either. It's like now you know the whole world in America is like in these situationships and they don't feel liberated by it at all. It feels like this prison sentence that they have to endure. (laughs) Well, like they hate it. Like, it's not like me critiquing what the youth are doing and the youth love it. They hate it. Like they talk about this on amongst themselves all the time. You know, what's interesting. It's like, they hate it, but they can't fix it. Oh, there's, that's everything. Yeah, it's like we can never get on the same page. It's like we're on the same page feeling-wise, but not action-wise. Yes. Well, if I could better teach 20 men the right thing to do than that I were could do it myself is a rough approximation of a line from The Merchant of Venice. Mm, yes, exactly. It's like... Uh, you know, anything with, we all hate microplastics. No one wants them. A lot of people are, are neutral about that. Plastics? 
Yeah, like a lot of people like think of like everyone in like a mall in middle America. They don't care about plastics. A mall with two stories. A two story mall in middle America. But do you think they'd be opposed to getting rid of plastic? If it imposed any inconvenience inconvenience on them at all. Yeah, like the straws. And now we all hate the straws. I've been against the straws from the start. I've always thought that was bad. Now, what I think would be a better idea, what I want to bring back is bo- refillable bottles. What do you mean? What's a refillable bottle? You're telling me I can't get, I can't go and get a, a refill of Head and Shoulders. Oh, actually, there's and a return place. my bottle. There's a place who in- Head and Shoulders. LA that that does this, but it's not it's not head and shoulders brand. I need it to be head and shoulders. Do you know I wash my face with head and shoulders? I do because that dermatologist told you to just let it trickle down, right? No, that was an old dermatologist who told me to let the shampoo just sort of get there. Then I had a new dermatologist tell me to actively wash my face with head and shoulders. And so I do. Oh and it's really helped with my redness. I don't know. Hmm, Interesting. When Um, they say head, they mean the whole head. Do you wash your mouth with it too? (laughs) I brush my teeth. It's like my Dr. Bronner's. I do laundry with head and shoulders. (laughs) I clean the floor with head and shoulders. I certainly hope you moisturize afterwards. Um, Yeah, of course. I put on my SPF, my La Roche-Posay SPF. Okay. Okay. How's my head looking? Wrinkle-free? Yeah, very unwrinkled. Did you just iron it? Yeah. Well, I Why can't you iron skin? I didn't do it myself. I had Sam do it. You shouldn't iron your own skin. Everyone knows. Yeah. <laughs> Dangerous. Um, you can't iron skin because it's skin. <laughs> <laughs> I think it would be nice if we could iron it. It would be nice. Yeah. I mean, it'd be nice if you could do a lot of things to your skin. <laughs> My face is looking really wrinkle-free. I must have the blur setting up really high or something. No, no. You're just naturally wrinkle-free. No, I don't think so. Um, okay, well, you know, that's one of my greatest ambitions in life is to be an older woman with as few wrinkles as possible. Now, I know we're talking about ambition today, but does that count? No, I think I, that's not the ambition we'll be talking about. That's just, yeah. that's just a segue. That was just a segue. Yeah, don't worry. What is ambition? Why don't you start us with the deaf initiative? We teach women to make themselves smaller. <laughs> you can have ambition, but not too much. Otherwise, you threaten the man. Now, we teach young girls to compete with one another, not for jobs or awards or accomplishments, which I think can be a good thing, but for the attention of men. Mm. Ba-da, be-da, ba-da-da, ba-da-da, da, da, da. Do you want to tell everyone where that little speech is from? I don't think everyone knows. <laughs> they know. <laughs> they don't they? They don't know. <laughs> How many of you knew, audience members? I would be, I would guess one in I guess one. <laughs> no, I think they all know. That's from Beyonce's song. Um what song even is that? I woke up like this. Oh the song God. with I woke up like this in it. I'm not even thinking of the song. It's from a a graduation speech from what's her name? Oh, it was a graduation speech? Yeah. I think so. A commencement I speech. I thought it was from, I thought it was a TED Talk. Maybe it's a TED Talk, same genre. <laughs> We, the woman who wrote, we should all be feminists. And I don't know if I can even try and pronounce her name, even though I've read that book and Americana. Shinamanda Ngozi. Adichie. Adichie. Was I close? That was just from my head. Um. Yes, you were. You were. Okay, anyway, great. This is a speech she gives about being a feminist. But anyway, ambition, I guess, is just sort of striving for something it's wanting to have it's a strong 
vision and determination to be successful, I think. To be successful, to get to the top. Yeah, you want to get to the top. You're willing to put in the work to get there. Now, do you think of yourself as an ambitious person? I really don't. No, I wish I was more ambitious. Mm -hmm. How's that played into your life? Well, I just think that, okay, I just think that (laughs) it's like what you said to me once. You said, if your goal in life, you can have one priority in life and you will get it, but it has to be singular. So if your goal is to make money and then you can make money. But you, the second you add a single other criteria in, and I want to make the world a better place, you're screwed. Yeah, it has to be singular. Yeah, because the fields in which you make money are not very attractive to people with other criteria. <laughs> Maybe being a doctor, but you have to be smart for that in this way that I am not. No, you can... Yes, you can make money. Um, It's not like no one with another criteria makes money. People do all the time, you know. Um, But it's it stops being guaranteed. Exactly. Whereas the people who I know from from high school and college who have decided I want to make a good living and that's their sole criteria have picked jobs accordingly. Yes. And they have, on a 100% success rate, <laughs> Yes, are making excellent livings. Yes. Now I have The rest friend. of us, not so much. I have a friend. She's obsessed with buildings. So she wanted to be an architect, but she didn't get into architecture school. So she became a building engineer. And now she makes a very good living. And she gets to do her job that she's obsessed with. And she said, in retrospect, I'm so happy I became an engineer because they make so much more money. Mm. So it just so happened that what she wanted also made money. So that's possible. Yeah, it led her down that path. But again, it's not the guarantee. So anyway, I just know for a fact that pursuing these external, uh, you know, benchmarks, making money, being powerful, being, you know, renowned ultimately would is empty and therefore crushes my will to go after it Mm -hmm. but i wish that i believed in it more i wish that i had decided that these things were empty like later in life like in my 50s and then began my internal journey of satisfaction so that way i could have both yes well it's very much you know we're studying at school, the book of Kohelet, which Christians may know as Ecclesiastes. And it's King Solomon, who's a very wealthy fellow, talking about how uh, the vanity, the utter va- futility of material goods, um, which, you know, he can say because he has them. I was just and- going to say that. It's like, oh, to be a rich person and cast away your riches. Yeah, and, and I always thought, like, all I want is to publish a book. Mm-hmm. Now, I know it won't like, I had some sort of sense that it would fulfill me completely. My life's goal would be good and I could just die instantly and be. But this other part of me knew that if I got that accomplishment, it would not be as fulfilling as I thought it would be. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I thought, okay, well, you know, let me get there and, and I'll see. So I did get a book published, but then I instantly generated a new ambition, which was to get a book published with a better publisher. And, you know, so only when you reach the absolute top of your field. Okay. So let's imagine I get the next book published with a good publisher. I'll generate a new ambition. Okay. Um, then I'll probably peter out at some point. Very few people go all the way. Mm -hmm. But let's imagine you really go all the way. You've written Harry Potter. Only that person who has achieved it all knows the secret, which is that it won't make you happy. Right. 
the rest of us have to just take that on faith <laughs> <laughs> when it's like, no, it really seems like it. I really think it would make me happy. Right. But wouldn't it be just swell to figure it out for yourself? Cause then you have, you still have the knowledge and you have all the other accolades that come with writing Harry Potter. Exactly. Now both. the emptiness and the success right now, you just have the emptiness. <laughs> It, is there so you say you're not an ambitious person but do you want more from this life career wise i don't know i mean listen i think of myself as not an ambitious person but it's all relative like i'm around a lot of people who are successful to varying degrees yeah, I'm surrounded by people who are doing moderately well, who aren't necessarily um, struggling all that much, who come from, a lot of them come from affluent backgrounds. I went to exclusively private schools my entire life. And so, you know, I'm, my idea of ambition and success might be different from someone else who hasn't had these same privileges. Like, I might seem ambitious to someone who didn't have these privileges, but to me, I'm just not normal. Yeah, but I don't, I actually don't think it's all relative because it is all relative. Like, I think the question is how you perceive the distance between where you are and where you want to be. Mm, and that personal is what you mean. Yeah. So, like, I think that someone who just wants, you know, like, just wants to be a senior claims adjuster. I'm referencing an episode of a really brilliant episode of Frasier, <laughs> where Frasier goes on a date with um, this woman named Anne, who's a, a claims, an insurance claims adjuster. She's played by the brilliant, what's her name? Uh, Julia Pat. Sweeney. It's Pat. Yeah, the SNL actress from the it's pat sketches wait so aside really quickly i think it's pat has come full circle to be uh progressive again oh really i saw a clip of it's pat and i was like wait <laughs> is this progressive anyway well, maybe it's like the merchant of venice like jews really like the merchant of venice like we like doing subversive readings of it. We like it as a study of anti-Semitism. Sure. We like it also because it's like a good play, you know? Yeah. Um. So maybe It's Pat is the trans or non-binary merchant of Venice. Could be. You know, a text waiting to be reclaimed by the very people who were initially subjugated. Yeah, it's it. like these. It's message. All these people are obsessed with knowing this woman, this woman, no, this person's gender. And and isn't the joke on them? Isn't the joke on them? Don't they look crazy? Yeah. In the <laughs> end, what their inability to just like deal with Pat <laughs> as a human being reflects poorly on them. Yeah. The movie. They made a whole movie out of that. They made a whole movie out of it. It's bad. It really stuck with me as a child. There was this one line where the guy becomes so obsessed with finding out Pat's sex that he f falls in love with Pat, really. Mm -hmm. And he's chasing Pat down and he says, I know we fit together. I just don't know how we fit together. Oh, wow. And there was, I was a child and I don't think I had ever encountered something so sec queer and sexual, let us say. <laughs> the The very fact that he was like countenancing the idea of Pat being male and still wanting Pat, mm -hmm. it thrilled me. Let me say it, it, it both disturbed me and thrilled me. Yeah, that, is, that is a I like that's a heavy line whoever wrote that brava <laughs> good for you uh, 
Okay, so oh, uh, Anne, Anne, the Anne who came to dinner. Yeah, so he asks her, she's a, a claims adjuster for an insurance company, and he goes, what are your dreams? And she goes, well, I would like to be a senior claims adjuster. And it's like, yeah, why not? You know, like, I I personally think we dream too big in America. See, I don't know about that. I'm not so sure. I... Uh... Obviously, like I'm I'm way more in that position than you. Like I'm on a career path and I'll just like climb the ladder and live comfortably, you know? Mm-hmm. Um and I'm quite ambitious. You you would identify as ambitious. I think so. Yeah. 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 Um, agreed. I feel like sometimes even you're a little bit bewildered by how unambitious I can be. No, no. I I mean, sometimes I like I wanted you. I got a little excited about the idea of you becoming a detective. <laughs> I thought that would be a good fit. And I thought you were a little too scared off by the idea of having to be a peat, a beat, a beat officer first, pay your dues. <laughs> but you just have a very inquisitive mind, so I thought it would be Yeah. No, I I think that um, like I said, like, I, I really do think that there is a societal, like some, some, I, I guess I just want to say that you have to dream big to land in the middle. <laughs> Maybe you have to dream big to land in the middle. And I really feel like parents need to like, let their kids dream big, help them dream big. But more than that, I really feel like peers are highly influential on how successful you'll be. Like if you go to a high school where everyone's getting pregnant at 15 and they have like, you know, that's not the same as the high school I went to where everyone was going to like a four-year college. Yeah, it's all about the peers for sure. I guess like, okay, so artists are very ambitious people in a way that we don't always conceptualize them, I think. Mm -hmm. and art like yeah like creative people are very like yeah focused on fame and on money and on impact yeah and but at the same time their their ambition is not making them money so that it's just causing misery (laughs) that's the ambition that i think is like too big in america um, and the I feel like to be famous. Yeah, but I feel like I'm having one of those moments right now where I'm going to listen to this episode and feel like I didn't actually respond to what you just said. What did I just say about the peer groups? You did not respond to that. And I really did want to dig into that. But so let's go back. I just felt like I wanted to clarify what I meant when I said, like, we have too much ambition in America. Uh-huh. So I think that often it's like, I do think we should, I and I really believe this, I do think people should like want to live good lives. And this is where like I push my friends to be more ambitious. I'm like, don't you want a nicer apartment? Like, I think people should want like... <laughs> I'm rolling my eyes right now because Matt, every day of my life criticizes my apartment. And it's I'm not like, just... And I'm like, to a homeless person, this apartment's great, Matt. (laughs) (laughs) It's not just you. There's a lot of people who I think should have better apartments, including myself. Uh Uh-huh. And nice furniture and nice dishes and good sheets. Oh, yeah. Good sheets are very important. I have good sheets, though. And, like, doctor's appointments. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, let's go back to the peers thing. I do think one time when we were younger, you said that your parents made a very crucial decision to like move to a suburb with like a fancier public high school, like a fancy high school. Yeah. And that that made all the difference in your life. Yeah. Like I think about like who I would have been if I stayed in in Lemonster. You know, like, 
would I have had like swoopy pink bangs and been like a weird mall gay? <laughs> like well, you were sort attracted of... to those kiosks with the rings already, so. A, yeah, like a sort of goth mall gay. Yeah. You know, like Lemonster, I think, is where JoJo comes from. Okay. So you can make it out of, of Lemonster. Of course, you can make it out anywhere, but it's just the, or you, you know, it's not the, it's like that you have to rise above as opposed to rise to where the line is. Yeah, I just rose to where the line was. Right. At your high school that you did go to. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Me too. Yeah. Like, but then again, I'm going to return to the idea that like we have too much ambition because some of the kids in these college bound high schools aren't cut out for college and they go because all their peers go and it's not actually what they want or where they'll thrive. And it shouldn't be in our society what you need to like have a career. It like kind of is in some ways. Yeah. I mean, I agree with you on that, of course. But it's really hard to determine that at such a young age, too, you know? Well, it's hard. It's it's only hard to determine it because we so heavily emphasize college as the right and virtuous path. Like, we really, people want their kids to be ambitious. Right. People don't want their kids to just, like, at least in communities like this, people want their kids to have really big dreams and like to go chase after them. They don't want them to like, you know, get a job as a bank teller. Yeah. And... There are plenty of communities where people do want are that's ambitious to that community. To be a bank teller? Yeah. Where that's ambitious? Yes. But that's just like expected and normal and not stigmatized. I don't know, a stable job where you work 40 hours a week at a bank? Yeah, to like the community of Skid Row, that's ambitious. But I think like <laughs> at Cecil Hotel. <laughs> How about a job at the Cecil Hotel? Wait, speaking of the Cecil Hotel, Cecil Hotel documentary that everyone watched. Mm-hmm. Um. That lady who ran that hotel, she you could tell she was ambitious. Yeah. And she was like going to mm-hmm. take on this tough job and like whip the place into shape. <laughs> Do you, who stays there now? It's closed. Oh, really? Yeah. For the best. For the best. Yes. Leave I, the ghosts in peace. Uh-huh. I don't know. So I guess we're, I, I, I mean, is ambition the result of nature or nurture? Because you've had these really ambitious people who do come from, like, humble backgrounds. And then you have people who are, like, given a lot of opportunity and, like, use that opportunity a medium amount. Yeah, it's, it's obviously both. You know, it's like, if you are raised in a culture that teaches you to be ambitious, like, you will be. But there are definitely people... Or like most of the time you will be. There are definitely people who are go-getters. And you can be a go-getter for a lot of different reasons. You might be a go-getter because you have something to prove. You might be a go-getter because you have a vision that's like really alive to you that you want to bring to the world, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, You might be a go-getter because you have like a void. Yes. Why? Yes. You might be a go-getter because you don't have a fully developed frontal lobe. Yeah. <laughs> um, what about people who have really big dreams and like ambitious ideas, but they don't have any executive functioning or logistical abilities? Like we don't call those people ambitious. Ambition is the I do. I actually do. Really, I don't. I call them dreamers. Mm, that's probably a better word for what they are. 
they dream big, but they just cannot implement. Yeah, that's really hard. That it's is such a uh, hard fate in life. Yeah, yeah, that's a lot of creative people. That's it's like a lot, lot of artists. It's a lot of creative people. Yeah. And, oh, you know, I'm the someone... sculptures you'd sculpt. Yeah, exactly. I'm someone who is very capable of executing complex logistics. Okay. Um, and even I get overwhelmed. Like, for example, and I'll do a little post on uh, the the Instagram about this. Matt and I are thinking about doing a limited merch drop. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. I'm overwhelmed with the logistical details. I'm like, how do I get a bunch of white t-shirts? How do I get a bunch of blank tote bags? How do I shut up the Shopify? And I know I can do this and I and I will do it. But for someone who like is doesn't have these skills, that that's very difficult. Let's do let's get the t-shirts that the Marianne Williamson. <laughs> okay. Thanks for your input. Used. <laughs> I have it. My friend Claire bought me a Marianne Williamson. Oh, it was your friend Claire? What was it? You? I'm gonna shut down the Zoom. I've never been more offended by anything <laughs> you've ever said. <laughs> it was like you. I'm almost <laughs> so mad that I can't keep going. <laughs> you laugh. And he laughs. I thought it was Claire. I gave it to you when I came to visit you in Israel. It's like a host gift. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I loved it. Uh huh. I loved You're it. Like, Claire, Claire, and I do this podcast together called How to Be. <laughs> <laughs> um, my friend Rory. Got me a Marianne Williamson t-shirt. And let me tell you, I loved the way my body looked in this shirt. (laughs) And I tried to find, I tried to get more just in white. But it's like a merch t-shirt brand you have to buy in bulk. Yeah. So if you take a photo of it, then I'll try and order them. Okay. So Beyonce. Beyonce is very ambitious. And I always think about the fact that, like, it takes some degree of beauty and skill and charisma to get your foot in the door in the music business. Mm -hmm. But once you've got your foot in the door, it seems to me that ambition plays a very, very big role in separating the Beyonce's from the Maya's. Yeah. Well, also ambition and like the, when we're saying ambition, are we also just saying like being hardworking to the point of insanity? Yes. (laughs) Yes. Yeah. Like, yeah, I think like some people, like some of these like, female pop stars in like the R&B world like they get they get their foot in okay like uh what's her name Amari don't know who that is it's that one thing that's got me tripping okay it's like Amari she got her foot in the door she got there she had a top song it was really great the song was actually i think originally written for Beyonce but that's oh. not important and you know she got some money. She got some fame. She had a good time. She met yeah. some nice people. <laughs> then she went home. Then she went home. Maybe the story's more complex than that. I don't know. I don't want to offend her. I'm sure she's listening. But that's what it appears to be. Whereas these other people, like Rihanna. Rihanna was originally branded as just sort of like this really basic pop star. Yeah. And then it it really seems like she pushed for something much bigger. Yeah, but I was going to bring up Rihanna. Where does Rihanna fall? Because she hasn't put out a new album since 2016. But I, she does have an incredibly successful makeup line. Yeah, I think that's where her ambition is now, being like a mogul. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, it's like sad that she never made another album. 
I mean, there has to be something wrong with you to be Beyonce. Like you're not, I, and by wrong with you, I just mean you're not like other girls. You're yeah, not it's like other people to have everything. She has everything and more and is still producing such high quality work. High quality and so much. It's constant. Yeah, producing, producing. Her and Taylor Swift. Yeah, Taylor Swift is another example of someone who said, no, I'm going to take this to a completely different level. It's like, why would you do that? It's so unbelievable to me. That where does, what, yeah. are they, what are they grasping for? What are they grasping for? Yeah, like, it's like, yeah, Taylor Swift was already the biggest artist. And then like the Eras tour, she like, she's like, no, I'm going to. There's, I've reached the top level, so now I'm going to create a new level right. above the top level of a god. It's truly scary. It is scary. And I really do believe that for me personally, enough exists out there. And it's not too far away from the realm of possibility. Like it's within the realm of possibility. For you. Yeah. Because I'm like, I think I'm ambitious, but not endlessly so. For sure. No need to create new levels. <laughs> if I'm, if in some universe I was at Taylor Swift's level, and I've always said this, I'm like, why do these movie stars keep making movies? Also, why do they keep making bad movies? Maybe they didn't know it was going to be bad. Or they have bad taste themselves. Yeah, I'm like... You, couldn't you just only make amazing projects like Kirsten Dunst? Like, why is Dakota Johnson in this, like, weird Spider-Woman movie? Oh, who knows what that person is thinking. But my question, going back to Beyonce and Taylor Swift, is, like, are they motivated by extrinsic factors still? Like, are they still motivated by, like, do they want to be richer, more popular? Or is there something intrinsic that they're still striving for like are they trying to fill a void well i think that maybe there is it's like you get so big and you wonder well how big can i get you want to i, I bet there's some curiosity mm. like i'm not at the end of the road yet i should keep pushing yeah i've pushed this far and i've gotten everything i have through the push so why not yes keep pushing I think there's also probably a fear of what it would mean to become past tense. And I, I, yesterday's icon. I wonder if it also, I mean, yeah, that's absolutely true. Like the idea of like, I mean, as we all, uh, it's contending with your mortality, really. Yes. Yeah. That's really the subtext of this whole episode, really. Yeah. Yeah. But then I wonder also, it's like they have so many other people's, like, they're their own economy. Like, do they feel the pressure of all the live, lives they financially support? How much do you yeah. think into their, their thinking? It probably plays in to some degree, but also, like, they can help those people get new jobs. What, a recommendation from Beyonce can't get, like, a costume designer a great job <laughs> in the industry? You think she has to do a recommendation? She's yeah, I think she's to do that the reference call. Yeah, she... <laughs> they don't just look at the costumes from the sh from the Renaissance tour. <laughs> she she has them write a letter of recommendation. She signs it, and she like jazzes it up and signs it. Well, uh, let's bring. It. I have a little research here. Um, so there was a seven decade study done of ambition, and oh. Um, results indicated that ambition was predicted by individual differences, conscientiousness, extroversion, neuroticism, and general mental ability, which is true. You got to have the mental ability to make these things happen, right? And a That's kind of what you were saying. What? Yeah. And a socioeconomic background variable, parents' occupational prestige, which is, you know. What's that mean? I think if it means like if your parents are white collar or very successful, that's going to be a big indicator that you're not going to be a bank teller, I guess. Okay. No knock to bank tellers. 
ambition in turn with well i just did knock them though no it's just that it's not a knock it's just not a very ambitious position it's not that it's a bad job it's a wonderful job it has great hours ambition was positively related to it pays well yeah to educational attainment occupation prestige and income but it does have um, (laughs) ambition has a meaningful effects on your career success so if you're ambitious you probably will be successful it's not that hard to be successful in a career if you stick with the career Mm -hmm. and use common sense like the ladders are designed to be climbed the ladders are designed to be climbed um it just might take you longer than you may want it to, like in my position. <laughs> but I know I'll get there one day, so I don't get as stressed out about it. To senior claims adjuster. Yeah. One day I'll get to senior claims adjuster. Yeah, and I'll be senior rabbi. <laughs> um, yeah, ambition is strongly, strongly predicts career success, but weakly related to life satisfaction. Oh, interesting. Studies have consistently shown that people who are motivated by extrinsic mark extrinsic markers of success, such as wealth, status, or popularity, aren't as psychologically fulfilled as people fueled by intrinsic motivators, such as personal growth, deep relationships, or knowledge. Now, that's a good question. That's a question I have about ambition. Can you be ambitious about your spiritual goals? Because that seems almost paradoxical to me. Like, I'm going to be the most successful meditator this side of the Mississippi. That sort of... Yeah, I think I think you totally can. Um, I mean, what motivates someone to become a meditator? Uh, it, it's like the same thing. They might, you know, like, you're going to have some non-enlightened reason to meditate. That's a guarantee. A hundred percent, but like that ambitious fury. Yeah. And then that will, that will eventually be the last hurdle you need to overcome of samsara if you manage to peel everything else away. (laughs) Yeah. Or you could just start like me where you just do 10 minutes a day. Yeah. I mean, yeah, but maybe you're like, well, what if I did 20? I know. 10 makes me kind of calm. That's not me though, baby. Yeah, I I kind of maintain meditation ambition. You're a ambitious. Bit. I'm ambitious. I'm ambitious. I'm like, may I'll be enlightened, even though no one I know is, and no one I can even <laughs> like no even people I know who like meditate a lot, but then I'm like, maybe they are. Like maybe they're like chilling on the inside and I don't know. There was that guy who worked at that cafe. Yeah, that guy who worked at the cafe, he was, that felt like that was just him to me, though. But remember the day he was really um, frazzled because he didn't get his meditation in in the morning? Yeah, he was still, like, good, though. Yeah, yeah. But that's because it should carry you. It's, yeah. <laughs> I. It Yeah, like, he was still, he was still mostly fine. I think that was his general nature, was be, he was a good-natured, affable man who was not, like, seduced by, by the screens, by telephones, or, yeah, I never see him, you know? I never see him anymore. I never run into him around town. Hmm. I wish I did. Um, Cutie. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. I can't decide if I think ambition is a good thing or a bad thing. It's not a bad thing, but it can be a bad thing. I wish that more people in this world that I live in and like the society that I live in were, I just like, I know so many people who are kind of constantly in a tizzy about what they're going to do with their lives or what their purpose on earth is. This is truly a trait of so many people I know. And I see it as very destructive. Um, And I kind of wish that we had some sort of way to reorient ourselves towards 
watercoloring just for the hell of it at home and baking muffins and falling in love and, you know, raising puppies or children or cats, having growing food, all these things, like having a beautiful life is what I'm talking about. Okay, I would love to talk about this more. First of all, I think that I'm that's where I exist in that space of like mm-hmm. I just want to have a nice life, a nice day, you know, and I have I'm a hobbyist. I have certain hobbies and I have no ambition to be like the best hobby, the best meditator. Them. Meditator, yoga person, yogi, baker. Mm-hmm. Well, no, I do want to be a better baker, but I'm not but there is want to be better than your friends. <clears throat> yeah. Better than my friends. That's right. Um, but there, like you're talking about the lifestyle of living well. But now, like with the birth of social media, it's like that has be you can that has become ambitified. That is such an interesting point. And it's so, it's like very interesting to me because I was thinking about this when I was thinking about this episode, like these people who are decided to become like trad wives, traditional wives, stay-at-home moms, but they obviously have something in them that is ambitious and is looking for those external accolades because they have created these giant social media followings that take a ton of work. Yes, I'm going to be the... I'm going to just live a beautiful day with my family. I'm going to do it better than anyone could ever possibly conceive. (laughs) I'm going to make brownies so slowly. You won't even believe how slow I can go. (laughs) Yeah, it's, it's insane. It's, it's truly, it's very paradoxical. So yeah, it's like, if you can somehow manage to live a nice life in a way that's not about appearances it's so hard in our culture our culture is all about presenting whatever your whatever your life is outwards yeah it's like how would we behave if there's if we there's no one seeing anything yeah well no one does see my life i mean they hear this podcast and see the 20,000 Things I publish on Instagram and on my various social media platforms every week. But they're not seeing a lot of photos. <laughs> they're not seeing photos of my beautiful life. The fresh cut flowers. The salt lamp. How exhausting I think it must be for your life. Your lifestyle to be your business. I would. That's actually my like the I, the worst career to me would be an influence lifestyle influencer yeah because it would taint everything it would taint your relationship with your kids i mean this was like a great scene in the sh- in the new nathan fielder show the curse where they have a reality show about their work and their and their relationship and they have a horrible relationship but they manage to have a, a really cute moment together that's authentic where he's trying to help her get out of her sweater and he's pulling it over and then he flies back and they're laughing and it's sweet they have an actual sweet moment for once and then she's like we should redo that for our (laughs) socials and it ruins it so like if you are if you are a family blogger a family vlogger yeah you how can that not make you have an acquisitive an acquisitive relationship to your family yeah a monetized attitude yeah terrible way to live you're like your your life isn't a break from your work yeah your your lifestyle is your economy is your livelihood yeah that's the worst let's let's call that the worst kind of ambition <laughs> absolutely um, I just have one more point to bring up before I'm done with all my topics. Laziness. Well, laziness is actually, there's no such thing as being lazy. Being lazy is a trauma response. Yeah, the internet has decided to 
um, retool the concept of laziness. Um, either it's a trauma response or you're not lazy. You're just afraid of success. Yeah. Actually, bed rotting is a healthy... Okay. Do you know about bed rotting? Yeah, of course. Okay. Sometimes mean? like... Explain bed okay. rotting. Sometimes like a trend... That, like a trend will come out that I feel that I'm like, wait, I invented that. But then I realize like <laughs> everyone has been saying that. Like everyone calls that thing we do in our beds where you're scrolling bed rotting. <laughs> Just like how I used to feel like I, I felt like I thought I invented new phone who did this. Because <laughs> I think that's a really natural way to ask that question because you don't want to be too aggressive. So you say dis. Yeah, like you don't like maybe it's a close friend and you don't want to insult them. Sure. New phone, who dis? So, but but everyone was doing it. So it turned out not to have been me who invented it. But I, I was like, what? We all came up with that. Anyways, bed rotting. And now there's all these articles that are like, bed rotting is actually a really healthy self care technique. And it's like, no, it's not. Well, it's just, horrible. Just it ask kills yourself. Your soul. Does it feel good? Yeah, it feels like rotting. It feels like rotting. So listen, no, no, you don't have to go to the pillory if you do it one day. But it's like that everything must be good for you. Everything you do must be good for you is like, yes, like everything has to be part of the wellness narrative. Yeah, if you're doing it, it's actually good. Never feel shame about wasting your life in bed looking at TikToks. Heaven forbid the shame from that prompt you to get out of bed and put away TikTok. <laughs> I do worry that I'm lazy, though. Really? Do you think I'm lazy? No. I don't know. I feel like I could be working harder. Well, but why? Beyonce never feels that way. She's like, I work hard enough. Yeah. No, she probably does feel that way. Okay, but objectively. Also, like, why no music videos for Renaissance? <laughs> Lazy. Lazy. <laughs> um, yeah, like, she's so ambitious that she probably does feel like she needs to work more, even though she's, like, literally doing the most. But... I mean, I'm lazy, too, in a lot of ways. I think everyone's lazy in in certain ways. And it's a trauma response, really. Laziness is a spectrum. Yeah, it's like, yeah, sometimes we don't want to do things because it's miserable. Making yeah. dinner. Ugh. Nothing depresses me more than dinner. This should be a little teaser for our episode about lunch. Oh, yes. We have a special guest next week. Next episode. Yeah, who's going to be talking to us about the power of lunch. The power of lunch, baby. We're really excited about that. And, um, well, sh a couple things. I had a couple, I, we, had, I had, we got some feedback on some of our episodes. Oh. Um, one listener said that he does letters to his future self as well. Oh my but god. He actually writes letters to other people as well. So other people in his family will receive a letter from him two years in the past. Three years in the past. It's so cute. Mm hmm Very cute. Everyone should consider doing that. Should I like send one to my like nephew? That would be cute. Do you think they like already got him an email address? To Jillian on his third to to Lucas on his 37th birthday. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then another listener was listening to the communication episode and said, wanted to point out that, you know, communication listening styles are very fluid and they depend on the context. Who are you talking to? Are they older? Are they younger? Mm -hmm. Are they mm -hmm. your friend, your boss? Very true. Very true. True statement. Keep that coming. I like that listener feedback. Yeah, listener feedback. We want to hear it. Um, so in conclusion on ambition, I, I agree with Adichie. Is that her name? Chinamanda Nagozi Adichie. Adichie. 
Um, I agree with her that we should have ambition, but not too much. That's not what she was saying. She was actually saying the opposite. But if you take that statement out of context, <laughs> that is the answer. You should have ambition. Yeah, I agree. I also agree with that out of context statement. You can have ambition, but not too much. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, good stuff. All right, Matt. Always a pleasure. Love ya. Love you too.